tax collectors are allowed to overcollect if they think someone is hoarding or hiding wealth, like what adventurers would do. There are specifically legal limits on the amount of overcollection a tax collector is allowed to perform. So I got some dialogue. One of the men shouts through his visor. Throw down your arms and submit to a search of lawful tax collection. Or face the wrath of house hacks. So that can happen to the players. Hello, this is David with Three Arcs, and on this video, we're going to cover nobles in the Viscounty of Verbabank for the Temple of Elemental Evil campaign. My previous video, we talked about agents of the Temple of Elemental Evil from the temple into Nob and the Viscounty itself, and also agents within the city of Verbabank, and some talk about agents in divers because as I mentioned before, the temple does not exist in a vacuum, that they need supplies to feed their troops, to pay their troops, recruitment, uh, slaves and prisoners for sacrifices on the altars and fodder for undead, and also to work as slaves in the temple. The temple reaches out far and wide within maybe 500 mile radius of Nolp. Not only are they recruiting bandits in the area with Nolp as a base for banditry and piracy, but they're also in league with other forces in the area like this Knoll Fortress in the Lort Mill Mountains, the Giants of the Lort Mill, the Blackthorn Orcs down in Welkwood that is sending war bands north into the Gnarly Forest. They work closely with slavers in the Wild Coast, including the Scarlet Brotherhood. Uh, they work with all the thieves and assassin guilds in the city of Greyhawk, the Wild Coast, Divers, and the city of Herbabank. And also, what they need more than anything is support from, they need support from nobility and rich merchants from these major cities. Because what the temple needs is too much for just for a band of bandits to handle, to, to be able to supply the actual temple. They need strong support from the cities. Uh, somebody that's powerful enough to keep things down low, so not to tip their hand of what the temple is up to. Somebody that is affiliated with the temple. And I covered that in my last video of uh, one of the lords and a couple of the rich merchants and assassins and thieves in Verbabank that I use in my campaign that the players will come across and meet or be introduced to, but they don't really know who they are. But there's also uh, NPCs in Divers and in the Wild Coast and throughout the Viscounty, including the village of Hamlet. I also outlined the connection between all of them, who they report to. We have agents in the field that go back and forth that coordinate things that's happening between the gnomes and the humans in the Crown Hills, and also all the banditry, the gnolls, and the black thorn orc war bands out there that are raiding into the Viscounty and capturing merchants and slaves that are capturing that are capturing caravan merchants and piracy on the rivers and bringing all those supplies to the Temple of Elemental Evil. In this video, I'm going to go ahead and review all the lords of the Viscounty of Urbabank. The Council of Lords that's led by Viscount Wilfric in the city of Urbabank. And as you can see, I use World Anvil to coordinate and organize this information. What you see right here is my organizations that I put together uh, under uh, Factions of the Flaness. So I pretty much have almost every faction that has anything to do with the area listed here. And under one of these factions is the nobility houses, the noble houses of Verbabank. And we have quite a few of them. So we have uh, Osbury, Millenius, Longmere, Avgustin, Delaview, Shondell, Gallens, Hax, Reinhurst, Stefina, Baswell, Bellison. That's a list of 12 noble houses that the players can come across in the, in the campaign. So in this video, we're going to review some of these and go over what can happen in the campaign with them. D&D &D had a huge impact on my life. I started playing in grade school after Star Wars came out in 1977, where I started a gaming club that led to D&D. &D. At the time, I would be found in a classroom, keeping my head low, buried in a fantasy book. The D&D &D blue box set changed and consumed my life. Quickly after that, I bought the AD&D Player's Handbook by Gary Gygax, which had a massive influence on me. I highly recommend these books to read. Rise of the Dungeon Master, Gary Gygax and the Creation of D&D &D by David Kushner and Corin Sadmi. This graphic novel is a quick read, and it is a brief glimpse into the life of Gary Gygax, the creation of D&D, &D, the controversy, and the effects that the game had on pop culture and many lives that it touched. The next book is Empire of Imagination, Gary Gygax and the Birth of Dungeons and Dragons by Michael Whitwer. I found that this biography is a series of fictional vignettes about events in Gary Gygax's life. 
loosely connected by nods at context, which is more of an inspired by true events story than an actual biography. And the last one is Of Dice and Men, the story of Dungeons and Dragons and the people who play it by David Ewalt. This was a fun read about the history of Dungeons and Dragons. The author injects that some scenes from one of his own D&D campaign, which, is, which I liked, but sometimes it strayed a bit, a little bit too far from the subject and covered a lot other role-playing games. I was really happy to identify with a lot of the scenes in this book and not just from playing the game. You can find my affiliate links down below. Before we look at the first house, House Osbury, you see that uh, on the right-hand side I have a map here. Um, this is a map you can find. You can Google it and look for it. And it's from Living Greyhawk. Now, these houses were created by the Living Greyhawk, the, the triad of the Verba Bank area. They were created for the Living Greyhawk modules that they ran from the year 2000 to 2007 or 8. And there's quite a few modules in this area. And I pulled a lot of information from these modules to run my campaign. It flushed out the area. It detailed the villages and all the local authorities and NPCs in the area. And I tied them all into the Temple of Elemental Evil one way or another. Also, I'm running these adventures too for in the campaign to help level the players up, to help get them engaged into the campaign, uh, have a feel for the Viscounty and the city and the lords and the Viscount. Um, get them involved with the politics of the area because a lot of that has to do with the Temple of Elemental Evil because they're using these resources outside the temple to grow. This map here you see on the screen shows areas in blue of the lords of the area, uh, their feasts. The map shows their domains, the noble domains of the area. I'll go ahead and bring up the map larger on the screen so you can see it better. But Millenius is in the middle there and just south of that is House Osbury. And um, there's even uh, houses within the city of Verpabank too that the players will come across to my campaign. So let's go ahead and start with the first house. Okay, this is House Osbury. Um, I put this in World Anvil to help me keep organized. Let's go ahead and use the larger screen so we can see better here. The house was founded in the year 438 Common Year, following the end of the Sort War, which was the combined forces of Valuna and Thurandi that drove back the Keeland invaders. By the way, a side note, that's one of the reasons why the Cathedral of Trithrin is so vital to the city, so popular, so important, because their paladins were instrumental in throwing back the Keeland invaders in that war. During the fighting, a young knight ranger of the Gnarly Rangers, his name is Artemis Greensward, he distinguished himself as the leader of a group known as the Flames of the Gnarly. Also, he was named after the sword that was wielded by the young leader. Um, operating behind enemy lines, his command wrecked havoc upon the Keelan supply lines. Upon cessation of the hostilities, the Plar of Luna granted him land and the title in the Viscounty of Verpabank. The grant situated in the east central part of the Viscounty stretched into the Gnarly Forest near the Fens of Tor, west about 40 miles and north to south about 20 miles, including a parcel known as Osbury Meadow. A manor house was constructed within the meadow, and the house took its name from that location. One problem we have with the Living Greyhawk modules is that they were not very specific. They did not map out the exact locations of the Lord's domains. They didn't show exactly where the borders were or where their capital was, or like the manor, where, where it was located on the map. So I had to actually make a lot of this stuff up myself in my campaign map. But I do know that House Osbury is north of the village of Hamlet which um, Rufus and Byrne is in the future, they're gonna be, that's going to be their domain. And then they're south of Lord Millenius' lands. And as we will go over Lord Millenius after this one, but um, Lord Millenius is trying to uh, take over uh, Lady Eleanor's lands. So back, we'll go back to the history again. Artemis and his lady, Yvonne Greensward, she was a guide and a member of his company, they established their household upon Osbury Meadows in 440 Common Year. The region was fertile and blessed with abundant rainfall, and during the 43 years, Artemis and Yvonne ruled the holding, and it developed a reputation for fair dealings and bountiful harvests. House Osbury is blessed with the birth of three sons, all whom they followed their father's example with service into the rangers of the Gnarly. The eldest, Gregory, fell while in service, and though occasional, and this event was a great sorrow to House Osbury, established the tradition that sons of Osbury would each in turn serve the forest. Uh, this is a great tie-in for somebody's background if they're playing a ranger from the early forest. 
In 483 Common Year, Marcus Greensward, the second son of Artemis, assumed the title of Knight Protector of Osbury. In 497 Common Year, Artemis Greensward died and was buried in an unmarked grave in the Gnarly Forest as he requested. I suppose you could pinpoint that location in the, in the Gnarly Forest for the players for some reason, some plot point. Each succeeding generation continued the close abiding affection of the land and characterized the first Knight Protector of Osbury. Each male descendant of Artemis served among, amongst the rangers of the Gnarly. No few distinguishing themselves in that service. It is rumored that Langard himself can claim men of House Osbury as kingsmen. I think, uh, I know Langard was a future. I know Langard was a future Viscount of Verbabank in the year 494, in the year 594 Common Year, which, which is the year that the Living Greyhawk series was run in. But I'm running my campaign in the year 576 Common Year, which is the original uh, venture into the Temple of Elemental Evil. So I have to rewrite a lot of this stuff to fit. The, unti the untimely death of Simon Greensward in 566 Common Year while rescuing the Lady of House Millenius from bandits left House Osbury without a, mayor, without, without a male heir for the first time in the short history of the holding. Aluna Greensward, a strong-minded warden of Alona, returned to Osbury Manor to assume the duties of the holding. So she was... Druid or a cleric of Ilona, probably a druid. And then the marriage of Kylalan Aldowain Tresgard to Lady Aluna Greensward of Osbury surprised many. Kylalan, an untitled adventurer rumored to be from Divers, took the family name of his bride in the wedding held at Osbury Manor. Kylalan was guided by the advice of Armont Andalarian and his longtime adventuring companion. Lady Aluna gave birth to Eleanor Tresgard and Delorian, Greensward of Osbury. Sir Armont, Seneschal of House Osbury, was appointed Eleanor's tutor before she was able to walk. As the Temple of Elemental Evil's hordes descended upon Osbury Manor, Sir Kylalain entrusted Eleanor's safety to Armont's care. Sir Armont protested, but he knew that Mistress Eleanor, alive, the Osbury family could recover. With the majority of Osbury landsmen and guard, Armont evacuated to the city of Urbabank. Sir Kylaline, Lady Aluna, and 12 of the Osbury's finest guard stood vigil at Whistler's Bridge. The Battle of Whistler's Bridge was brief and costly. All that stood in the battleground died to give Armont and others time to reach safety behind the massing troops that were to meet the horde at Emmerdy Meadows. And of course, you can watch and listen to my Emmerdy's Meadows song YouTube video that I, YouTube video on my channel, under the banner of his noble lordship, Viscount Wolfric. Armont, Sir Armont, mindful of his duties, attended personally to Eleanor's education, respectfully declining offers of assistance from his holiness, Bishop Hoffren, Bishop Hoffren of St. Cuthbert, and his most honorable, Sir Elric Millenius. So Bishop Hoffren has been around forever. He's the Archbishop now of the Church of St. Cuthbert, which is the official state religion of the Viscounty of Verbabank. And one of the reasons why he holds that title is because of the Battle of Emmerdy Meadows. The people saw how great they performed in that battle and how they saved uh, Wilfric himself. And um, people are starting to make, they, they, like it, they like his sermons, how the mat factual matter of sense straight no nonsense sermons that the the, the church is the church of saint cuthbert is known for um that's why the people are gravitating towards him where the viscounty used to be more of um more of a follower and worshippers of rayo which is what voluna state religion is the official state religion of voluna is rayo which is the god of serenity and reason the major religion of the Viscounty of Verbabak used to be Rayo. Since the Battle of Emmerdy Meadows, um, now they switched to St. Cuthbert. Armont felt that Eleanor must remain at Asbury Manor to learn as much from her people as from his tutelage. Eleanor grew up working alongside the farmers, herdsmen, and craftsmen of her holding, learning their hearts and earning their love. Armont tutored Eleanor in history, music, and statecraft. She excelled in the arts of diplomacy and politics, and while keeping an ever watchful eye on the faithful people of Osbury Banner. Eleanor loved the arts and sponsored many bards and performers with only 
a single favor asked in return, that being to teach her something new or unique, share a story of legend, or gift her people with a performance. She was pretty much an ideal ruler of her lands under the, um, Sir Amon's care. The young mistress of Osbury with honey-colored hair grew into a beautiful child blessed with compassion, knowledge, and the heart of Verbavank. Such a resource was not overlooked by his noble lordship Viscount Wolfric. Eleanor is recently appointed as Verbavank's ambassador to Voluna and given the appropriate title. The stagewoman that captured the hearts of so many is now Baroness Eleanor Tresgard Osbury, ambassador of the Celestial Circle, mistress of House Osbury. Sir Almont still stands by her side as a quiet source of strength. His teachings have led Baroness Eleanor to the forefront of, Vo of Verbabog's nobility, while his attention to her safety has provided Osbury Manor with a legacy. Obviously, from this background, you can tell us he's a good ruler. There's no way that he has anything to do with the Temple of Elemental Evil and its uprising again. I don't, she's not evil. She's lawful good, and she can be trusted. And the first, and the first module of this campaign is called Noble Ambitions by Living Greyhawk, and that's how I start the players off in the city of Urbabank by meeting her. She gives them this mission to recover the Osbury Gem and Flaming Sword that was lost at the Emerald. That was lost at the Battle of Emerald Meadows. So one of the secrets I have for her here on my website is Lady Osbury was once very much in love with Sir Simon Millenius, and she was preparing to marry him before he left to fight Uwes's hordes in the Shield Lands. After his return from the wars, Eleanor found Simon to be cold and cruel. She understands that the horrors of war can harden a man's heart, but nevertheless, Lady Osbury was drawn away from the reclusive veteran. She sadly admits that Simon is not the man she once knew, and any dealings with him are a burden and no longer a joy. So this secret is from the year 595 common year, you know, for the later campaign. But I'm going to have to rewrite this and resituate it for this campaign to where he went off to battle with, in, with Fiorandi. He went off to battle with Fiorandi to the Shield Lands, uh, some skirmishes, some fighting between Ewes. Um, this is all before the wars, is how I have this set. Okay, so this is her coat of arms. Um, it's the Shining Gem of Osbury and the Flaming Sword of Osbury. When I scroll down, we'll get to the notable members. So the Sir Armand Senesel of House Osbury. As I explained before in, in the history of Osbury, uh, Ar Sir Armand was the Senesel of House Osbury. He's a longtime adventuring companion of the young Lord Geoffrey. Eldowain, who took the name of Osbury upon his marriage to Baroness Eleanor Osbury. It was to his care that Lord and Lady Osbury remanded their child Eleanor when the hordes of Temple of Elemental Evil at before the Battle of Emerdy Meadows. Um, he's a tall man, he's gray, scarred, and possesses a shrewd mind. He has always regretted the duty preventing him from fighting and dying alongside his lifelong friend and lord. He's justifiably proud of Eleanor and serves her as he did her parents. Sir Armand traveled widely through the Flaness in his youth and has seen and learned much. Although his age has begun to erode his strength, he's still a formidable man with lance and sword. It is his tutelage that has given Osbury a solid core of fighting men. Capable, capable of defending the holding from the most threats and is responsible for Eleanor's not to be discounted skill at arms. The Senesel is a quiet source of strength and he's very open to his conversation with Eleanor, but otherwise he holds his tongue. Listening, engaging the motivations of others, something, he's very, something he is very adept at doing. The Lord's closest confidant is a steward, the steward Badisha Greensward, who is also a knight, visits and inspects the Lord's other's manners throughout, throughout the year. This helps ensure the honesty of the bailiffs. The steward is, is in her 40s, as not quick as he was when he commanded the manor girl. So the writing shows that the steward is a male but and in his 40s, but it's not true. Um, she's a female and she's in her 20s. And I'll show you her right now. And I'll show you in a second here, but... Um, not only can she re read and write, but also is skilled with numbers and auditing and can easily spot a scam or an embezzlement. Bodisha Greensward 
um, is of House Asbury, and she's a cousin to Baroness Eleanor Osbury. She serves House Osbury as a steward, supervising both the Lord's estate and the household. She appears in Living Grey Hot campaign module, the Verbavonk area. So her secret is she's got chain mail, a pendant uh, of a sword and a jewel. So anybody that knows anything about the coat of arms of House Osbury, she has the pendant of House Osbury. Anybody with nobility or royalty or bardic knowledge would know that she's a symbol. That's a symbol of House Osbury. The woman's name is Bodisha, and she has been assigned to escort Lady Osbury's tax payment to Verbavonk City. And the players will encounter her in another Living Greyhawk module, where Lady Eleanor is trying to pay her taxes, and somebody steals the, the money, and now she's in a lot of trouble. Back to House Osbury article. On the right-hand side is the notable members. We talked about Armand. We talked about Bodisha. And one more person I want to mention is Marcus. So Marcus Greensward is a cousin to Lady Eleanor and brother to Bodisha Greensward. Um, he was elected by the Cienega Valley Co-op as the land steward for the fr enfranchised peasants of the valley. He is a representative chosen by peasants and speak with the Lord and is the richest and most skilled farmer with a manor just west of the open market. So there was a tension in uh, Siena Valley Village about him being elected, and a lot has to do with Lord Millenius. Um, for a short time, there's grumblings uh, talking about foul play, and in the end, those affiliated with the Honorable Lord Millenius acquinced to the law and the land and the will of the people. Still, the presence of both Black Griffin Inn and the Jewel of Asbury Guardhouse speaks volumes of the tension lurking beneath the calm surface. Yet despite the precarious location of the town and even the recent threats of invasion, Cienega Valley has grown to be a trade center of note. Lady Osbury has taken steps to ensure the security of the town and invested heavily in the infrastructure necessary to support its growth. A sizable contingent of Osbury House Guardsmen, as well as the Viscount's own mounted borderers at the fort, and a number of brave adventurers decided to settle at the town. All are united in their desire to see the town prosper. Thus, the wine co-op has seen unprecedented profits as the reach the salesman stretched wide across the Vi County and beyond. So I brought this up because um, her family members are in key positions throughout her domain, including the Cienega Valley. And, it, and there's contention there with Lord Millenius trying to take over that town as well into his lands. And he really wants to marry her so he can actually absorb his lands into her. He can absorb her lands into his. The rest of these NPCs are just NPCs that are in key positions throughout the villages. So let's go back to the main um, table of contents, and we'll go ahead and look at House Millenius. His most honorable Sir Simon Millenius left Griffin Manor under the banner of the most honorable Sir Jackie Culgrim in the early of 563 common year with a hundred black griffin men-at-arms to join the Battle of Emery D. Meadows. He left a shining example of kind, compassionate man, very much in love with Baroness Eleanor Osbury. His betrothal... Now, now, so this is kind of off. 563 common year. So the, so the campaign I'm running is 576 common year, and I got here 563 common year. I mean, Lady Eleanor, I think she's only like 22, and so that would have been... So that would so that would have been thirteen years ago. She only would have been maybe nine years old. So I don't know about this. Something has to be rewritten here to make this make sense. Anyway, his betrothal to Lady Osbury earlier that spring resulted in many joyous festivals and performances. I used this information later in the campaign when this does happen. That's what I'm doing. Because this information originally came from Living Greyhawk, which is the year 594 common year. So it all has to be rewritten and rebalanced to fit the common year of the campaign. And that's something that has to be done. So this is all about him going off to war in the north, um, and then the battle with the flag of Thirandi. Sir Millenius was elevated in rank to right honorable sir for gallantry in battle. Tragedy befell his unit as Sir Millenius fell protecting Sir Colgrim in the battle that turned back the host of over a thousand of the old ones, the most decorated horde. Sir Millenius and Sir Colgrim was captured and held for ransom. So this all happened later in the Greyhawk Wars. Um, all this has to be ignored and rebalanced for the current year campaign. So then they talked about him paying the ransom and there's 20, 20 surviving men. That's all in the future. Then Lord Millenius returned and took over the duties of Knight Captain of the Mounted Borderers. This has not happened yet. 
He wants to be in control of the night borderers in my campaign. And that's one of the rumors I have that I'll show you the rumors later at the end of this video. So his disposition has changed greatly. Um, he, many said that Many said that he would come back to his own after the marriage and children. Lady Eleanor was not pleased by his change of heart, the lack of tolerance and kindness causing them to separate further and further. Eventually, Lady Osbury denounced the betrothal and Lord Melenius sunk further into his solitude. So part of this is going to be true in my campaign. Yes, he's, he's courting her. He wants to marry her. Um, he wants to absorb her lands into his lands ultimately. And yes, he is cold. He's intolerant. He's lawful good. Or you consider he's lawful neutral. Let's go ahead and take a look at him. His most honorable Sir Simon Millenius and Knight Captain of the Mounted Borderers. Not yet in my campaign. Master of House Millenius. Um, his uh, hel herald is shield of Black Griffin on the field of Azure. Lord Melenius is stern, dark-haired, broad-shouldered, and who seems comfortable in the power he radiates. He stands well over six feet tall, is intimidating, although not thickly muscled. His eyes are dark as his hair, and any man gazing in his eyes find them hard to, and he finds them hard and remorseless. Lord Melenius is rarely found without at least a half a dozen of his most loyal retainers, all of them wearing tabards and shields emblazed with his crest of the Black Griffin. So all this is mostly true in my campaign, and the party will come across him at the end of the first module, Noble Ambitions. After they recover the treasure of Asbury and they're returning, they're going to run into him, and he's going to try to take the treasure. His most honorable Sir Simon Millenius left Griffin Manor under the banner of... So this is more history of what I mentioned before. It's just a repeat. So we'll skip all this history and go right down, down to a secret. He will attempt to use Lady Asbury's family debt to House Millenius as a leverage point to force the marriage. But this fails when Lady Asbury is able to recover her house treasury with the aid of several kind adventurers and good luck. So that is what's happening at the beginning of this campaign. In, how, in, in, nobles, in noble ambitions, when the players first get together and meet at City of Urbabank and, they, and she, re, she puts out a notice, Lady Eleanor puts out a notice wanting to recruit adventurers to recover her lost treasure of House Asbury. And they hire her under secrecy. They don't want, she doesn't want anybody to find out. And that's why all the players, masters, they're ministers of the, of the churches and bishops, you know, they're all sending their players to this meeting to find out what Lady Eleanor wants because nobody knows, including Lord Millenius or the bad guy, the agents of the Temple of Elemental Evil in the city of Riverbank don't know either. So they, they're, all, all, they're all trying to find out what Lady Eleanor wants. All they know is she put this notice out. Everybody knows that, but everybody, everybody wants to find out exactly what she wants. And the players are going to find out because she's going to recruit them. And she's going to, they're going to go on the first mission for her, with her, to House Osbury and then go to the dungeon to recover her lost treasure of Osbury, including recovery of the Flaming Sword and the Shining Jewel, which are both um, magic items. They're both artifacts. So when the players are at the meeting talking to Lady Eleanor, um, they're being interrupted. I, I mentioned this in the last video of session one of the campaign. I actually role played that in the video so you can go step by step of what happened in that scene. But she gets interrupted a few times that Lord Millenius is waiting to talk to her and they can tell if they question her carefully, they can tell she's not happy. Basically, he's trying to marry her. He's trying to force her hand to get to, because of see how desperate she is. He can't pay her taxes and she also owes House Millenius. And so see her estate, her domain is in a lot of trouble. And, and she's trying desperately to fix all that. And she needs her treasury back to help out. And that's why she's recruiting the players. So more about Lord Millenius. He's a very strong military leader, believing that might grants right and that nobility is won by the use of a sword. I think he's going to be lawful neutral. He has little tolerance towards any race other than human. He disdains gnomes and half-elves. He loathes the forces of the old one, you know, Uwes, and will slay any orc on sight. Half orcs are not attacked immediately, for they have shown useful in combat with the right amount of discipline if they are loyal. To be weak in his presence is to be unseen forever. Warriors and some adventurers that believe in his martial discipline are welcomed in his camp, as long as they show him complete loyalty. To break the trust and loyalty of House Millenius places a warrior is a warrior's death and immediate and without mercy. 
So it's possible in this campaign for the players to um, get into the camp of Lord Millennius, you know, follow his quest, follow his household to help him, to assist him. Um, but the campaign starts off with the players um, being hired by Lady Eleanor. And so there, if you have run an open campaign, a sandbox campaign, it, I let the players make these choices themselves. I present them with Lady Eleanor's adventure, her, her mission, you know, and they, if they accept it and they do her quest, they're welcome to. But during any time during that quest, they're welcome to change sides. They're welcome to not give her the uh, reward or not give her what she's looking for, but give it to Lord Millennius instead. They were sworn to secrecy. They're, they were not supposed to tell anybody about anything that's going on, but if they want to tell Lord Millennius everything that's going on and follow his orders, they can. Then they, at that point, will be part of Lord Millennius's house. They'll be favored by him, but they, they'd probably be an enemy of House Osbury. So it's up to the players who they want to support. And this is only two of the nobles in the campaign so far. Again, Lord Millennius's lands adjoin Lady Osbury to the north, and it is interested in possible alliance between the two holdings. Griffin Manor is located just north side of Penwick, so Lord Millennius uh, House is actually located at Griffin Manor, and the, the Living Greyhawk modules are a little bit confused about that. Um, they show that the, there's a Griffin Manor in the city of Herbivonk, and also there's got to be a Griffin Manor in the Viscounty itself in his lands. So I have two Griffin Manors which is kind of weird, but I have one in Penwick, just north of Penwick in the village itself. And then he has another one in the city of Urbabunk. On the right side is his banner, his herald. Um, he's level 12 knight, um, and he's got his stats here. He's got a sword, a long sword called Demon's Bane, which is an artifact. And of course, he has a whole list of magical items. He's got this war horse named Pegasus. And as it was mentioned previously, he's always followed by a handful of his retainers at all times. I say about a dozen, sometimes more, depending on the situation. And one of those retainers is his close confidant. His close advisor is Canon Albert Sagos. He's a priest of Heronius. So that means Sir Millennius venerates a follower of Heronius, the god of silvery and war. And he's never seen without his um, canon at his side, his co closest advisor. Okay, these rumors are located in my article for the Temple of Elemental Evil Master Plot. Um, I got a lot of this from the, I got a lot of this information from the Fane of the Eye, the Prophecy, the fifth edition module that was put out for the Temple of Elemental Evil. And we got a, and we got a lot of rumors here of what's going on. Um, some of these don't have anything to do with the nobles, but if we do scroll down, I do have a few. One of the rumors is Viscount Wilfric is a puppet to the nobles. That's a rumor that the players can hear. If the nobles want war with the gnomes, then war it will be. So that's something that the players can pick up. Another one is Lord Merlinius. He's pushing the Viscount to name him Knight Commander of the Borderers. So that's something else he's trying to do. So if in the campaign, they can't, the players side with Lord Millennius and pull something great, do something great, like stop the Blackthorn war band from um, raiding into the Viscounty and, and assisting the, the mounted borderers in Lord Millennius' name. It'll make Lord Millennius look really good. And that might just push the, him over the edge of uh, actually having the Viscount to name him the Knight Commander of the Borderers. Something like that. A recovery of the, the gift to Selene the gift of Rayo, if they recover that chest in the name of Lord Millennius following his orders and turn it into him, that could also name him Knight Commander of the Borderers. So it's always possible to support Lord Millennius instead. Okay, so farther down is a rumor about Lady Osbury. So this is a rumor that occurs later after the players do the first uh, venture called Noble Ambitions. Uh, people hear that Lady Osbury has uh, herself a pet dwarf. She's got him chained to his anvil, turning out swords and weapons. Somebody better keep an eye on that wench. Um, other rumors are that some of the nobles are putting more men under arms. I think something's going to happen soon. So this, these rumors all lead to war with the gnomes. And that's what the Temple of Elemental Evil agents are fostering. They're encouraging this. They're setting up these raids, these faults, these fake raids, attacking the mounted borderers. Um, they're, they're stirring up trouble. They're stirring the pot. They're getting the people of Urbabank angry at the gnomes. And they're getting the gnomes angry too. And the temple, of course, is working with one of the cl gnome clans in Tolver um, to help pull this all off. 
that's a whole nother series of Living Greyhawk modules that has that set up. Okay, back to the main article. So let's go ahead and take a look at House Langmire. There we go, House Langmire. Lodovic Langmire is a nominal, Lodovic Langmire is nominal head of House Langmire. And it's a small parcel of land right at the Viscounty's heartland. The real power though, resides with Lodovic's mother, the Iron Lady Godavella Langmire, from whom the phrase, too mean to die, has coined, along with other darker whispers, but no sensible person would pay any heed. In his late 30s, Lodovic is still unmarried, partly because his mother considers most of the, most of the candidates beneath him, partly because she enjoys using marriage prospects as a political ploy, but mostly because eligible noble ladies shudder at the prospect of marrying into that family. Rumors of Lodovic's alliance with one of the maids ended with the poor lass's tragic fall down the stairs. And it's best not to discuss the implications of such an inappropriate and scandalous topic any further. Godeleva is currently tantalizing factions in Voluna with prospects of alliance, which makes her less than popular in many of Verbabank circles. Still, House Langbier puts on a public face for support for Viscount Wilfric and pays its taxes to the Viscounty in full and on time, which allows Godelva a great deal of latitude in her actions. Godelva is playing a dangerous game with objectives unclear to any but her, but she may be shrewd enough to pull it all off. Lord Lodovic heads the house. Rumors say that he is a mere puppet to his mother, the ancient Iron Lady. Also, also, only the highest ranking members of Verbabonk's nobility are permitted to have heralds clear the road for them. I added that last part because in one of the modules, um, the party will encounter her, the Iron Lady on the road of the Viscounty. When they're heading off south to on one of their missions, they're gonna come across her. And I have a whole role-playing scene for that too. So before we go into that role-playing scene, let's talk about the background. The ancient and honorable House Langmire traces its history back to the earliest days of Verbabank, when the land was part of the great vice royalty of Firand, Firandi. Founded by Diphtherius Langmire, a distaff scion of the family that now rules the Viscounty of the Reach in Firandi, House Langmire was increased in influence under the wise leadership of its noble rulers. The current heads of the household is Baron Lodovic Langmire and the Dowager Baroness Galadiva Langmire have led the house to great prosperity. However, much of the greatness of House Langmire is obscured or worse, slandered by those that envy the majesty and puissance of her founders and heads. Many would seek to supplant House Langmire or to dispose of them from the Viscounty. Viscount Wilfric himself felt threatened by House Langmire and the house is considered by some a greater claim to station a Viscount than those of Wilfric's descent. That means they have a greater claim for the seat to the Viscounty, which is huge in the political circles with the Council of Lords, and that her, pl her plots are coming to fruition when it comes to that, depending on who she marries her son off to. The slander has reached even the ears of the peasants and the tenants that farm House Langmire's lands and both Baron Lodovic and Baroness Goladeva have been obliged to put down uprisings that were fermented by slanderous rumor. It is these rumors that have given Baroness Goladeva the effort of Iron Lady. No doubt to her testament of strength of will and decisive nature. The current voice of slander seems to be coming from the adherents of the Church of Trithrin. And you remember in that video of, uh, I think, session one, I had that entire speech by the Archbishop himself of the Cathedral of Trithrin in the city of Urbubank on day one. Who seem to feel it is their duty to tarnish the reputation of anyone that has money or is profitable. So the members are of House Langmire is a small parcel of land situated right on the heartland of the Viscounty, befitting the status such as noble and regal house. The regulator of House Langmire is expected to put well-being of the house before all other interests. Regulators perform their duties with extreme diligence, whether due to the generous monetary compensation of fear or fear of disappointing Baron Ludovic or Baroness Galadiva. 
So we'll look, we'll go back to the other map here. Um, it's hard to see, but if you zoom in, um, it's right in the middle, just to the west of Lord Melinius's lands. It's basically the breadbasket of the Viscounty. Now let's take a look at her article. A lot of this information is the same uh, about the, you know, the rumors and the puppet and the Iron Lady and all that stuff. Um, but she does have her secret political plans. This is a secret information for the DM only. Don't let the players read this because it tips off of what she's doing in the campaign. And if you wanted to, and it's possible she could be an agent or inadvertently be an agent of the Temple of Elemental Evil. Viscount Langard has been in office long enough now to begin to tell which of the nobles are loyal of the Viscounty and which one care more for themselves. Um, change that to Viscount Wilfric. Um, Langard is from the year 594 common year, so we're not using his name anymore in my campaign. He has begun to employ much of his old friends from the shadowy past in key positions around the Viscounty. They are his eyes and, e and ears, and sometimes his hands in place he can no longer be. The Viscount is well aware that Lord Bellinius's allegiance to him and the Viscounty is not as firm as it once was in the past. The Viscount is also aware that Lord Lodovic's Langmire's mother, Lady Godelva, the Iron Lady, is not a strong supporter of the Viscount and the, in the Viscounty. He does not yet realize that Godelva Langmire is in fact a traitor and a master manipulator. House Langmire, ruled by the crafty manipulations of the Iron Lady, has decided the time is right to make its move for power in the Viscounty. If House Melinius and House Osbury are weakened, then House Langmire has much to gain. And this has all come from the Living Greyhawk module VER401. So things come to confusion. And then the next rumor, that for DM only, is Godelova Langmire has been in discussion with her father, Lord Morelkos William Hax, as a noble match for marriage with her son, Lodovic. Lord Hax is daughter Savra. Savra finds this insufferable at the notion of being traded as another transaction of her father to be married in, to such a distasteful man. After Lord Hax informed Savra to his decision of the a marriage arrangement, she ran away to join the Feather Gale Society. So the leader of the Feather Gale Society, his name is Thurl Moroska. He sold Savra the idea of the cult and she, so she followed him from the city of Urbabank to Feathergale Spire. This enraged, this enraged Godelva and will stop at nothing to retrieve Salvra from the clutches of that cult, even as far as paying mercenaries or adventurers to steal her away. That's another plot point to give the characters. So Feathergale Spire is the location of the Air Temple. The knights ride those giant vultures and they raid the Viscounty under the guise of being uh, uh, an aerial club for sport. But, they, but whatever they do raid, they, they make sure they're secretive about it so nobody will find out. Anyway, the, the daughter of Lord Hax, um, which is, uh, he's actual mayor of the city of Urbavak, uh, she ran away um, because uh, the, the leader of the Feather Gale Society talked her into it, told her how, how great it was. Uh, they don't know that it's an air cult to the Temple of the Mental Evil. They just think it's a society of flying nobles. And she's a noble's daughter. So she went off to join him to learn how to fly these uh, giant pegasi, griffins, and vultures. So uh, if you wanted to, um, the players could be hired by Lady, the Iron Lady, to, to find her and to... Um, bring her back to Lord Hax so her dot her so her son can marry her and then that will cement her ties to the Viscounty and then then she can supplement supplant then she can supplant Viscount Wilfric with Lodovic and he'll be the new Viscount next so the, all these political maneuverings are in play here um, it's up to you whether or not you want to include her secret noble ambitions or political activities to the Temple of Elemental Evil. Maybe the Lord, that Lord in Verba Bank that the players saw at the dinner at Jiley's Inn, maybe um, he's using her to help her get what she wants and she, unbeknownst to her that she's actually helping the Temple of Elemental Evil. Because the ultimate goal of the Temple is to cause confusion and disarray, put people in power for them to control. So this is all something that can be planned in the future of your campaign, which I've been working on too. But my players haven't gotten that far, so I, I haven't really actually flushed it out yet. But all the meat is here to be used in the campaign. 
Okay, next is Lodovic, um, Lord Langmire. He's somewhat paunchy and balding. He's the nominal head of House Langmire and its small parcel of land in the heartland. Although he's in his late 30s, Lodovic is still unmarried, partly because his mother considers most of the candidates beneath him. We talked about that already in the main article. Um, we talked about her political ploys, her ambitions already. But on the right-hand side is a picture of him and, you know, his stats and things like that and his affili affiliations. And this is the arranged marriage I talked about earlier with Savra Hacks. That could be interesting in the campaign. Okay, and some some of the notable members of our household, we got Davin Bausch. Let's bring him up here. Um, he's a stout man. He saunters down the street, pats of his armor, marking him as a sergeant of the watch. Um, he's dim-witted thug, but he's far from it. He's intelligent and patient. He keeps a tight rein on the daily, on the daily workings of the city guard. Anyone that spends time with him get a sense that he's a little love for the law and an uneasy feeling about the coldness in his eyes. He serves the Iron Lady over the village of Ederbuck. He's in charge of the guard, captain of the guard, pretty much. And, and I got some background and history of who his mother was and how he was raised. Um, his philosophy, if anyone suspects a crime brought before the watch sergeant boss for requesting possible detainment, he never suggests a bribe, but he will accept bribes in private, things like that. And he's got a catch phrase is, light and darkness live in all of us and one will triumph. I've made my choice. Have you made yours? Things like that. And I got this all ready to go. Um, contacts and relationships of he's a member of the guard. Um, bribes. Um, he's harassing anybody that's a follower of Farlong. So if any players in the group is a cleric or a druid of Farlong, then he'll be harassed. And he's also receiving secret messages from the high priest Cornelius Arx. Cornelius Harx is the actual archbishop of the Cathedral of Trithrin, the Church of Trithrin. So um, there, there's a lot of things going on in this campaign the, behind the scenes, not just the nobles themselves, but the people under them. Also, there's Thomas, Sir Thomas. He's a knight and vassal to House Longmire, and I got him ready to go here, but I didn't fill, fill him out yet. But um, he's the main knight retainer for the Lord and Lady of Langmire that the players would encounter. I created this role-playing scene for the players that come across the Iron Lady, Godzilla Velodvik. Um, as the players are traveling southwards through the Viscounty to get somewhere, like from the city of Ripavonk, and they go near the lands of Longmire, maybe as they're approaching Ederbok, I have this happen. As the wagons and their mounted guards set closer, you see that the flying banners from the wagons, a voice can be heard shouting at you, Make way for Cadella of House Langmire! In the distance, you see a wagon train coming your way with banners and flags flying, a parade of knights, of mounted men, uh, before and after the caravan. Across the fertile lands of the Viscounty of Verbevonk, through the farm fields, along the road coming toward your direction from the south, a wagon with a line of mounted men are making their way towards you. You see, there must be a dozen knights and men-at-arms. The mounted guard are flying banners from their wagons. A voice can be heard shouting at you, Make way for Godeleva of House Langmire! At this point, I could have the players make a knowledge of nobility or, or royalty checks, or maybe a, a bardic knowledge to find out what the banners are. And depending on their knowledge, I could I have a couple choices here. The first choice I could share with the players is that the flags that they see flying over the horse and wagon flies the crest of House Langmire, a noble house of Verbabank. Lord Ladovic Langmire is the head of that house. If I feel like they would know more than that, I could also share with them that although Lord Lodovic heads the house, rumors say that he is a mere puppet of his mother, the ancient Iron Lady, Godeleva Langmire. Also, the highest ranking members of the Verbabank nobility are permitted to have heralds clear the road for them. So this is something I share with the players about the difference between adventurers, peasants, and the lords of the land that it's expected for them to get off the road and let them pass to, to give way to the Lord and his men. So if the characters do move off the road as the wagon approaches, they notice that the first wagon is more of a coach. The curtains are drawn with rich, dark cloth. The second wagon is indeed a wagon. It is covered, and what it may hold is not ascertained from the outside. Twenty guards, all with lances pointing high, accompany the wagon and the coach. 
As the coach passes you, one of the curtains draws back to reveal a pinched and ugly face of a noblewoman caked with makeup. She looks down her nose at the group and mutters, Adventuring filth, before letting her curtain drop. The wagon trundles on, splashing you with thick, wintry mud, and continues on towards the Verbovong city. So at this point, um, you know, I'll ask the players what they're going to do. If they're going to get off the road, if they're just going to stand there, they're not going to say nothing. I'll find, I, I question the players to find out what their agency is, what they do. And when they hear this, I'll question them again and how they might respond. The smart ones won't say anything. They'll just stand there and take it. But at that point, when it goes by and it splashes them with mud, I'll have them make a, a deck save to see if um, they're hit by the mud or not by the wagons, if they can step back in time or they even try to step back. But if the players do stay put, the players do not move off the road, then the guards will fan out in front of the wagon and lower their lances. The first wagon is more of a coach. At that point, I'll convey to the players that one of the curtains draws back to reveal that pinched, ugly face. So again, if they stay on the road, the same thing will happen. Um, she'll draw, one of the curtains draws back to reveal a pinched and ugly face of a noblewoman caked with makeup. She looks down her nose at you and mutters, adventuring filth. She speaks to one of her guardsmen out the window and not to the group. And she says, clearly, these miscreants are unaware that the laws of Verbabank require they step aside for the nobility of this land. Count to five for me, Sir Thomas. And if they don't move, run them down. She then lets the curtain drop. I ask again what the players are going to do. The guardsman begins ominously counting to five out loud, as, in as instructed. If the players still refuse the buds, then they start to charge. So this is what happens next. If the characters display their affiliations, or they're wearing the livery of a noble house, or the mounted borderers, then the wagons come to a halt some 50 feet away. The lead wagon is clearly a coach, and the second is a covered wagon. One rider comes forward to meet them. So this happens um, if they're displaying this, and the, and, the, and the men on horses notice this before when they come within 50 feet of the players. The wagon train approaches. And if the players are displaying any kind of affiliations or they're wearing any kind of livery from a different noble house or the mounted borderers, then the wagons come to a halt some 50 feet away. The lead wagon is clearly a coach and the second is a covered wagon. You can't tell what's in it. The one rider comes forward and speaks. I am Sir Thomas of House Langmire. Unless you have business with Lady Godeleva Langmire, please remove yourselves from the road. So at that point, I ask the players what they do. Failure to move or give good reason as to why they wish to speak with Lady Godeleva results in her guards forming up and ready a charge. They're going to charge the players. Okay, in either case, this is what happens when they do do the charge. The guardsmen of House Langemeyer line up for their charge. Just before the word can be given, though, a cloud of dust can be seen coming from the north, from Verbabank City. As both sides wait to see what that can be, it quickly becomes apparent that two squads of mountain borderers approach. And they're approaching fast. They're at a fast canter. The mountain borderers have been sent to escort Lady Longmire to Verbabank City. They are, they are an honor guard. Once they arrive, they attempt to smooth out the situation. If any of the characters there are very severe in their language or are threatening or insulting in any way to House Langemeyer, then the mounted borders are forced to find them. Make it perfectly clear to the characters that if it were up to the mounted borderers, the situation would be dropped. Lady Godeliva Langemeyer forces them, though, to act and, and insisting on a hundred gold piece fine. Assuming none of the characters are nobles of Verbavank, obviously, then they will have to be explained to them indeed not given road to a noble is indeed punishable under law. They would know this. So it's, it's player agency that they decided not to give way, which is causing trouble. So here's a hint of how to handle this. The encounter is to show the disdain between Lady Godeleva at Langmire and all non-nobles, especially adventurers. Combat should not happen unless the characters attack first. If this happens, the mounted borders appear immediately to defuse the situation. I feel free, feel free to play Lady Godeleva Langemeyer as a mean old woman that she is. 
neither Lady Godileva nor her men detect as evil. So if the players try to detect evil, they're not going to find any. It's particularly important that the characters see her in this encounter so they can recognize her face later on. Um, this is really based on a scenario of a campaign. Um, I got this scenario from a um, living Greyhawk module called VER402, a costly gamble. And um, it's, it can be used any time in the campaign. That's why I have it ready to go here. Because I want this to foreshadow encountering her in the future. And so this is the player's first encounter with her. There's more than one way to put a stop to things. You know, you, sure, you can go to the dungeon and, and do a dungeon crawl and clear it out and kill all the bad guys. But that's not going to put a stop to everything. It's the root of evil is still everywhere, including in the city, in the politics. And, it, and to really completely... Um, to really completely conquer the Temple of Elemental Evil, you need to clear out those agents as well to find out who's at the top. So I often, I compare my campaign to the Game of Thrones meets Temple of Elemental Evil. Combine the two, and that's my campaign. And as you can see, my 12 nobles, they all have backstories and history and st steep lore in the land, and they all have their own ambitions, and things are happening with them. And a lot of these living Greyhawk modules where I got these lords from, um, they include these lords where the players are actually working for or against them. And so it creates a, a much more immersive, deeper campaign if you want to run something so epic like this. It's a lot. Of, it's, some, it's something, it's a kind of campaign that not many players get the opportunity to play or the patience to play for a couple of years. But this is what I'm running and this is what I've been working on for four years. Did you enjoy video? Consider tossing support on my Patreon. It best ways to support orcs. If you would like to see more content, subscribe and post comments below. It better not be bad. If you use any of these hooks in your campaign, I want to hear about it. Go ahead and put it down below. I'd like to hear about it. And I hope you run this epic campaign with a lot of intrigue and fun. And I hope your players have a fun ride going along with you.